All righty. What's up, landlords? Renee here. I'm going to have a chat with Hunter. This is our first time meeting, and we're just going to you know, live stream this and go from there. So Hunter, before we get started, something I like to do is I like to tell you everything I know about you and you correct me instead of me saying, hey, <laughs> tell us about yourself. So just to make it a little bit more fun. So Yeah, fair enough. Let's do it. All right, cool. So I, what I think I know is you were born and raised in South Carolina. Correct. Sweet. And you were Eagle Scout at 14 years old. I was. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. My my dad really pushed me to get into Boy Scouts when I was young. And there's a group of maybe seven or eight of us. Uh, and the dads all really encouraged us to go through at the same time. And uh, we got it done uh, before most people ever even really get into uh, scouting. So, yeah, fun fact. Yeah. That's that's pretty impressive. I've only met one other Eagle Scout when I was in the Air Force, this guy um, that I deployed with, and he was pretty sharp. So I know it means something, <laughs> even though I never did it. Um, tell me if I'm correct here. You went to Clemson University and got a financial management uh, degree with a concentration in real estate. I did. I did. Yep. So I sort of got the real estate bug in college. Um, Clemson does not offer a real estate degree. Um, some colleges do, some don't. Uh, but you could get a finance degree with an emphasis in real estate, which is which is what I did. So, yeah, that's correct. Cool. One thing I'm a little unsure about is how I found it somewhere that you helped college students get out of debt with selling real estate while you were going to college. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So I had a really unique business idea um, sort of came when I had some conversations with the real estate mentor. He was a fellow agent and investor, uh, sort of got me started. Uh, in my real estate uh, agent career. We wanted to help a bunch of other college students get licensed uh, like I was. Uh, so I got my real estate license at 19. Um, and we essentially said, hey, let's let's get a group of college students together. Let's all go sell some houses and we can essentially use the commissions from that to pay down our student loan debt and uh, hopefully graduate college debt free. So that was um, that was sort of the mantra that we we did, and, and we did that for about two or three years, I think, because uh, I, I got my license when I was a sophomore in college, uh, and sort of worked all the all the way through till I was a senior, and, and I'm still an agent to this day. But that was that was sort of how I got my start. Yeah, that's awesome. So basically, it was you guys um, collaborating together, but individually, you were selling your own houses and using that income to help pay down the debt. Is that how it worked? Yeah, pretty much. So uh, we had what's uh, sort of uh, known as a real estate team where we have a bunch of agents. There's one main agent who's considered the rainmaker or the person who's probably bringing in the majority of the business. And then the rest of us are trying to generate leads. Uh, we're trying to sell listings that we as a team or as a group had. Uh, and we had some really kind of unique and effective ways Um I'm sure there's videos somewhere if somebody wants to go try to dig it up. But uh, we used to have these electric scooters. This was back before they were even sort of popular by Bird and Lyft and some of these other things. Um, but we used to have these scooters. We'd go ride around from neighborhood to neighborhood. We'd uh, go door knock. So essentially, you know, asking somebody, hey, have you thought about selling your house? Uh, if we'd get a property listed in a neighborhood, we'd go knock on the neighbors and say, hey, we just listed this. Do you know anyone who wants to move in? Um, you know, really just trying to uh, uncover all the stones and, uh, you know, find those hidden gems, uh, whether those were listings or clients we could work with, um, doing anything we could. So That's really impressive. Did you, part of the pitch when you were uh, door knocking, explain that you guys are college students and you're trying to pay down debt by helping people sell their houses? We did. Um, yeah, so, catchy. you know, we're, we're young college students. Um, as it turned out, there was six or seven of us, uh, happened to all be guys. Um, I guess just because, you know, we couldn't find any girls interested in, in pursuing that career path. But, uh, so a bunch of us guys, you know, were there knocking on the, on the doors, you know, in all these different neighborhoods. And obviously we look like college students, you know, we're mm -hmm. a bunch of young guys. And so people are like, why are these weird college students, <laughs> you know, knocking on my door? So that was, that was part of the pitch. It's like, Hey, um, we have an experienced agent, um, the rainmaker of our team. That person had been in business 15 years, which is longer than most people, you know, have been in business uh, as an agent. So, hey, this person is the experience. You know, this is sort of the the person behind the team. We're doing some of the upfront life work to, you know, a market your property. You know, b try to uncover you know more leads and get more exposure. Uh, we always used to say that you know we're we're trying to. Uh, you know, door knock and cold call, um, you know, to try to find these buyers, try to get top dollar for your listing. Um, so that was sort of, you know, part of the sales pitch to it. 
Man, that's really good. It's creative and it, it has like a, a human feel, vibe, emotional kind of, it pulls at your strings. So it's like if you were kind of even remotely thinking about doing it, you'd be like, hey, let me help these young kids. And you just, they're trying to start their life and they're already in debt and stuff. That's great. Um, yeah, it was it was definitely a really interesting time in life and, you know, really sort of helped all parties because, you know, we're trying to generate more leads in business for the Rainmaker. The Rainmaker is giving, you know, these buyers and sellers very, you know, fantastic representation as an agent, um, you know, again, helping them buy or sell. And then we're just generating more, more activity, more interest on those listings. And, you know, again, trying to help them get them sold for top dollars. So that was what, what it was all about. <laughs> Yeah, man. So um, now that you're doing your own thing as an agent, um, do are you still continuing that trend or did you break away? Yeah, so we ended up sort of breaking the team off. I um, still have a great relationship with uh, with the uh, agent who I sort of partnered to build that business in the beginning. Um, but unfortunately, time just sort of happened. Um, you know, as, as all of us college students got older, some of us graduated, moved away to other cities. Some of us just decided, hey, you know, real estate, you know, this, this thing that we did was fun, but this isn't what I want to do full time as a career, which is, which is great. You know, that's what it's for. It's to help people make money and, you know, figure out what they want to do with, uh, with life. So uh, ended up being a really great uh, transition for me and for some of the others. So um, still an agent, uh, agent to this day. Um, that's really sort of primarily what my focus is um, outside of uh, some of my own investments uh, and, you know, being my own landlord, which I know we'll get into later on. So. Yeah, I like that man, property, property management stuff. Um, so yeah. it was basically you guys just threw this together. It wasn't um, like some kind of organization led through the the Clemson University or anything. And now that you guys all went different ways, it just dis disappeared, right? It did. It did. Okay. Um, we had sort of, so myself and the Rainmaker, uh, we had partnered together on the business side. So we were both you know, co-owners in the business. Um, and we had really looked at some couple of options, which were, you know, A, do we franchise this, um, which I don't think we had built up enough systems and, or had uh, as much of a success story behind it to really do that. Um, but we did hear of some other college students across the country. Like, I think, I can't remember if it was Texas A&M or SMU uh, in Texas, I think did something very similar. Somebody did and had a lot of success. Um so, you know, we were looking at, hey, is this a scalable model? Can we put it in other locations? Um, and I think also what I learned personally was that it's very hard to manage people uh, and particularly manage college students. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, wasn't something I probably wanted to do long term, but it was a it was a really good fit for me in that season of life. Yeah. So um, you I think you started out with Keller Williams, but then you some time you switched over to uh exp it, how how did you go about that why why did that happen yeah a great question so when i got into the business uh as an agent with that team uh team of college students uh my business partner and the rainmaker my mentor uh, he was with keller williams so i joined kw from day one i was in there uh in business with them for five years, maybe, um, maybe a little bit longer, then ended up um, just deciding, hey, you know, I've been with a couple of different KW offices. Um, at that point in time, I'd actually worked on staff uh, for two different offices. So sort of got to see the underbelly of the beast, so to speak, um, and just decided that, you know, hey, probably a good idea to branch off and, you know, join another organization, something that was going to be a better fit for the rest of my real estate career. So made the move over to eXp Realty and uh, been super, super happy with it ever since. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's pretty much almost the very end of what I, I think I know about you. I do notice that you have pink, peakventures.net and then you're you're running a podcast. Can you explain that before I get into the my property management questions that I like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Peak Ventures is our property management company. So okay. we can certainly dive into that here in a second. Um, but I did start a podcast. I uh, started a podcast with a, a good buddy of mine. Um, really, the podcast is centered around uh, sharing faith and biblical uh, inspiration in the business world. Um, so I'm a believer. My buddy is a believer. So we sort of co co host the podcast together, really all about sharing, you know, the truth of God's love, uh, you know, in business uh, with other people and, and really through their stories. You know, we don't want to be doing a whole lot of talking, but that's that's what we've what we've got going. So. Oh, yeah, I think we can relate there because my walk, you know, kind of it went through an evolution and kind of like I really like how it kind of ties into 
you know, business, serving other people and everything. We'll, we'll get to that for sure. That very good. Brave of you to put that out there because sometimes everybody wants to be political correct and they don't want anybody to not like them because they might be some type of believer or not, or they might, you know, be liberal or conservative and stuff, stuff like that. The cool thing with me down in Florida is we're a swing state. So you'll be around neighbors all the time. Some are really patriotic. They're like, oh, huge Trump fans. And then you got really liberal people that, you know, Biden and uh, Kamala Harris and all that stuff. And it's just, you see it all the time. And you're just like, hey, I, you're still my neighbor and I like you and everything. You just like <laughs> <Yeah>. different stuff. <laughs> Not a problem, but that's cool. And the um, the podcast thing, is that like a um, a hobby thing or is it actually trying to turn into like a business where you're getting sponsorships and you're trying to make money and you have like a partnership with, you know, other members? How's that working? Yeah, great, great question. Really, it's just a hobby thing for right now. Um, if it grows into something down the road, great. Uh, but really, we just want to be able to share uh, other people's stories. Uh, that's, okay. that's the biggest thing. So great. Um, so now my property management questions and stuff, do you want to elaborate on anything? Did I miss anything? It was just a little fun, like kind of intro thing that I like to do, um, before I go into yeah. the property management stuff. Um, yeah, no, Hey, all, all great questions. I will probably elaborate a little bit on my story. Um, cause I okay. think it is sort of important to where I got to today. Um, I ended up, uh, when I was working at one of the KW offices, uh, on staff, um, granted, I was still an agent there, but I, I sort of decided, hey, I don't really want to be on staff with KW. Um, each Keller Williams office is a franchise. And, um, you know, in any business, the business owners want to make a profit, which means either increasing revenue or cutting expenses or typically both. Um, and so normally within KW offices, you don't get paid a lot to be on staff. Um you know, I was sort of doing it in a time where I was transitioning out of college. And so, you know, hey, it's, you know, it's okay if I make, you know, not a ton of money because, you know, I'm, I still sort of have the college student mentality, right? You know, the whole ramen noodles and, you know, sleeping on friends' couches sort of thing. So, you know, I, I could roll with it, not a big deal. But I realized that this was not going to be a sustainable career path. Uh, so I said, okay, let's let's look for something else. At that time, I ended up getting connected with another investor who's local in my market. They were looking at growing a rental portfolio, uh, buy and holds. Um, they had bought a couple of properties, but were looking to buy more apartment complexes, you know, two to, you know, 50 units sort of, sort of thing. Um, didn't have a lot of experience. I had some experience at that point, both from uh, ownership and management, um, as well as just some some other experience I'd had with dealing with different investors and clients. So got connected with that individual work for about eight months, uh, eight to 10 months, um, and then ended up sort of transitioning out uh, to where I am today, which is a little bit more on the investment development side. Um, still wear my agent broker hat. Um, that's still, you know, the, you know, more of the prime primary thing, but uh, really just trying to focus more on the development investment side, um, both of managing uh, properties that, you know, that we own, uh, but also working with another individual local developer to me, uh, build out single family communities. So, you know, sort of building, you know, it, think of it as like a Lego set, you know, I'm, I'm putting all these building blocks in place to build on my knowledge and my experience in my career so that, you know, one day in the future, I can utilize that to, you know, do my own investments or do my own developments, things, things like that. So. Okay. Yeah. You got some farsighted, you know, ambitions that you're kind of, you don't know how you're going to get there exactly, but you're kind of moving in that direction. You'll figure it out. You're a smart guy. That's good. Cause I did have some questions along those lines whenever I was looking you up something i've had another podcast with another realtor and whenever i look up some of you guys realtors man your stuff is everywhere and it's so confusing to try <laughs> to figure out what is, where, where are you coming from what are you doing like what is this and i, I find links I, I google your name and a bunch of stuff find it comes up so um but thanks for elaborating on that because um yeah absolutely that at the very bottom, when I, because I try to give some feedback from my first impression of you, at the very bottom, we'll end with like, hey, you take it or leave it. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody and I'm just trying to help. So, um, and I'm, it's not like I'm like an expert. So I'm just saying, hey, this is what I was thinking in my journey whenever I was looking you up. So I will talk about that later. And that, when you elaborated more, uh, that was making sense for me. So, how long have you been in property management, like either doing it for yourself or maybe, you know, for uh, commercial, you know, apartments or anything? Yeah. So my property management journey also started in college. Um, 
So about the time, uh, or I guess this was probably a little bit before I got my real estate license. I worked for a uh, student housing property management company in Clemson, uh, where I went to school at Clemson University. So the little town of Clemson has lots of apartment complexes, as I'm sure most small college towns do. Um, so I was working for one, uh, helping to lease out the property, um, really just sort of learning the the ropes. So not in a property manager role, but in more of a leasing assistant, you know, sort of you know, jack of all trades type person uh, to get uh, students and to get people uh, there renting the property. Uh, I was one of the first people hired on to that group uh, actually before the property was even built. So we were technically pre-leasing a property uh, before they even started construction. So, you know, kind of a kind of a cool thing to do. Um, did that for, um, gosh, I don't know, six, eight months. Um, right about the time I got my real estate license, I transition from doing that uh, to going more into, uh, you know, wearing my agent hat full time uh, as a, as a college student on top of school. So. Okay. I didn't know that you can be a leasing agent without having a, a license. Is that correct? You can, you can. Yep. So okay. there was a property manager and maybe there was an assistant property manager. I can't remember, but there was a number of college students that they had hired to be essentially leasing agents. Um, very okay. common, um, you know, just showing, you know, model apartments, um, you know, just helping people get a better understanding of, you know, what, what that property was, um, you know, and, and if they wanted to, to uh, live there as a student. Okay. So how so, are you getting your, go ahead. Oh, no. Well, I, I was just going to say, so from there, you know, that was sort of my first experience uh, in property management. Most recently, it's sort of, you know, I, I did that for a little bit, stopped and then came back with the whole property management thing when we uh, bought our first property, self-managed that um, and still still self-manage uh, some of our properties to this day. So it's been, it's been about three years uh, since we started that. OK, cool. So um, how are you getting your property management clients now? Yeah, so right now it's really just uh, personal properties and family properties. We're not uh, we're not third party property managers. Okay, um, we're not trying to go build a build a book of business like that. Um, you know, hey, more power to the people who want to do that, but we really want to stick with the properties we own uh, or you know family members own, and we manage those. Yeah, because I remember when I first met with my uh, real estate agent that I have here down in Florida. And I kind of had some ambitions to like maybe be a property manager, get licensed and everything because I had some of my own rentals. And he's like, why would you want to get into property management? He's like, there's no money in that. It's it's a really, you know, thankless job. And I know what that's like because I was military police. And I was like, I don't want to be doing thankless jobs anymore because <laughs> um, <laughs> it's low pay and a lot of headache and stuff. So I'm like, okay. So it, it actually prevented me from going that route. And I just do my own self-management stuff. But um, uh. When it comes to when you first got your first rental property or when you became a landlord, how how long ago was that? Uh, about three, okay. almost probably three and a half years. So okay. it's and been then, a little bit. Yeah, then that's kind of like how it is in Florida because you can't you can't do property management services for friends and family unless you're licensed, but you can do Correct. it for yourself if you own it. So around the time that you're getting your own properties, you're also helping family, um, friends with their properties. Uh, not not friends again. Strictly just, just family, family members. Okay. Um, you know, very very closely related family members. Okay. Uh, with their properties and then ours. So, you know, again, I I could see from the very beginning that there's not a whole lot of money in third party property management unless you do it at scale, and yeah. you know, people can build those businesses. I just really didn't want to own that. But I'm like, hey, if I can help, you know us, you know, manage properties better. We're not having to spend tons of money every month on a property manager, tons on leasing fees. You know, uh, most property managers charge 50% of first month's rent, which if it's a thousand dollar apartment, they're charging 500 bucks to throw it on Zillow and, you know, screen a couple of phone calls and applications. It's, it's really not rocket science, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so. Yeah. That's I what just, I wish I could help encourage more mom and pop you know, landlords to take the reins and do it themselves because they really, um, I think might be more fear of the unknown or they think they're too busy and they don't realize how easy it is to do it. And, um, like the middleman property managers, like, honestly, if you have cheaper ones that are like smaller scale, um, if, 
they're in, they're going to have their own my side bias and they're going to do whatever gives them the most money. It, like you said, if there's apartment complexes where like they can lease and get, you know, higher returns and they have bigger clients, like let's say somebody owns like a multifamily apartment complex, they're going to put their most of their attention over there and they might neglect your stuff. And I even mm -hmm. heard cases where property managers will let go of smaller mom and pop landlords because they're too picky. They, everything is too, Hey, that's why are you doing that? That's too expensive. And, and, I honestly think nobody will run your asset better than you. So you're vested. That's your livelihood and stuff. So like, man, if you have less than 10, I really think you should try to learn it on your own and, and figure out systems that make it easy to do more of a hands-off style, which is possible. That's, yeah. that's very keen of you to notice that right off the bat. Yeah. Well, I definitely appreciate that. You know, I've, I, I do currently have on, on one property, third party, um, okay. just because it's, it's, you know, 10 hours away from me by drive. Okay. <laughs> so on that one, it, it made sense, but you know, nobody's going to take care of it. Like you will, you know, um, from my experience, most property management companies sort of form as an extension of the owner owning a lot of units in one area and deciding, Hey, you know, I've got all these other friends and people asking me to manage theirs. I can make a whole bunch of money for not doing a lot more work than I'm already doing. And that's sort of how it, you know, how it sort of expands. So then you get to a point where you have a third party property management company and the owner of the company still owns a lot of units. And he tells his employees, Hey, fill up my units first. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't want to have any vacancy, but, Oh, you know, it's okay if we have a three month vacancy on, you know, our small mom and pop, you know, who just has a yeah. duplex with us, you know, whatever, you know, yeah. if they fire us, they fire us, but you know, it's like that you typically sign a property management co uh, contract. So you're not going to normally fire your property manager. It's going to cost you money to get out of it unless yeah. you do it, you know, whenever it, it renews. So yeah, uh, that's another all, good all point. things you have to consider. Yeah. It's another good point too, because if, if your property manager is a real estate agent, what is their primary concern buying and selling houses, which they make the most money and they would kind of like keep the property management stuff on going. Cause it's like, you know, residual income, but it's not something they're tending to on a daily basis. I almost wish there could be like a behind the scenes. Um, like, do you, do you really know how much work your property manager is putting into your place? Like how little time and effort they devote to it. And a lot of them, some of the real basic ones will just be like a middleman. The tenant will reach them, reach out to them. And they will reach out to the owners. Say, hey, what do you want to do? And they're not, they're not even helping in those cases. It's, it's crazy. But yeah, you're, yeah. I'm, I'm on the same page as you. Yeah. So. I, you know, I, I definitely would not, um, you know, hire a third party for everything. I know there are some people that do, and, you know, I can even understand for a small percentage of your portfolio, but really when, when you're getting into it as a new investor, I really think you need to bite the bullet. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be really scary your first six months to a year, because you're not going to know anything, but you got to drink from the fire hose and you'll eventually figure out, you know, yep. what to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was able to manage my properties from the other side of the world. I, I spent like a decade um, working in Iraq specifically. And I um I had a property manager in the very beginning because I was scared and I didn't really know. And also every time I kind of talked to my, my property manager, he was an agent and a builder. I kept saying like, you know, I think I can do this. And he always was like, no, you don't know the laws and everything. It's harder than you think. And, and I was like, you know, I kind of want to try, you know, maybe. And I asked him one time, I was like, can I, can I try to do one? And you'd kind of coach me along. Oh, no, I don't have time for that. You can't do that. You either, um, you can take them all. And he, and I kept feeling like he was pressuring me to try to make it seem like it's really hard. You better stay with me. And, and he would give me invoices because he also had contractors and stuff and he would do rehabs and he'd be like, Hey, well, um, We'll get rid of all the, you know, the flooring. We'll we'll put new carpeted and some new tile. And like he sent me these big invoices. And I've, I remember one of them was like multiple thousands of dollars. And then he has to haul away the trash. And he's like, hey, can you give me your uh, tax, um, your proof of your tax bill payment so I can drop all this off at the dump? And, and then he charges me like a, a, a big fee for dumping all the debris. And I'm like, dude, you used, you got my discount for going there. <laughs> he didn't have any of that. And I just felt like all along the way, I was like, man, if I hired a handyman, I feel like a handyman would just knock this out on his own and be able to do it cheaper. And all those little instances over time, eventually I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to do it. Uh, and then he's like, all right, fine. And then I was like, can I have your lease? And he's like, no, you're not having my lease. And I gave him a hard time. He's like, fine, you can have it. And it was just a realtor general lease. 
But then I went and I met a real estate specific attorney. And then I told him, Hey, I want to do this. And this is what I'm doing. He's like, Hey, here's our lease. We, we vet it, we update it and stuff. And if you ever, if there's updates, we'll reach out to you and stuff like that. And I, I ended up using that lease, the lease, the problem that I saw with the lease that the agent was using, it was just super gibberish, all legal talk. There was no like plain language talk in there. And if you want a tenant to actually read the list, the lease and follow the rules, shouldn't it be written in a way they understand? So that was cool that my age, my um, lawyer has it written kind of more like layman's terms and it's easier to understand and and it's smaller and more, you know, compact. So the, that's my little bit of an evolution, you know, actually learning how to do it better just by taking over, you know? No, that's, that's great. And people do think it, that the forms make it so complicated and for sure they definitely can. But if you use good forms, if you have an attorney go through and, you know, check it, like that's, that's what I did uh, for our forms. I created them using a combination of different resources. And then I sent them to my attorney. I said, hey, I don't want you to go redline and completely change this. Just read through it. Is there anything that is really uh, against state specific laws? And if not, you know, can I get this, essentially the stamp of approval? He and did that and got the stamp. And he's like, yep. I, I mean, I maybe paid 150 bucks for an attorney yeah. to read through it. You know, it's like, and now we have a form that we can use year after year and, you know, all the addendums that can go with it and, you know, anything that's property specific. So, you know, yeah. it's super helpful to have, you know, those forms, you know, whether you get them from, you know, another investor, you know, a, an attorney, whoever. Yeah. And what you did is what I did. I kind of added some stuff because I wanted to do a little bit of, you know, unique stuff. Like I wanted to try to see if I, can, I didn't test and I wanted to see if I can capture more rent by offering at least signing. Hey, would you like to use the alarm, the home alarm system that it's a feature of the home. It's not monitored. If you're welcome to use it, we um, will make sure it's, you know, functioning and it's an additional like $15. He put in some clauses for that in a spot where you say yes or no. And then, and then I tried to experiment with like some extra storage. Do I, do I put some stairs and up in the storage and lock the attic access in the garage? And then is that another upsell thing? And uh, over time, what happened is I realized it's not worth the effort. It became too much, but, and I took some of that stuff out, but I remember working with the, the real estate uh, lawyer and we figured that out and he was really helpful. But the, when you said you, uh, that you also did something like that, you know what it made me think? is when a landlord goes through this process, they really start to learn and understand their lease. I remember when I was using the one that the, the agent gave me, man, I couldn't understand that thing. It was written, it was so long. And like, how am I supposed to help enforce it if I don't you know, really dive in there and read it and understand it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, exactly. And when you're leasing out new properties, uh, you know, to tenants, they're going to ask you questions about your lease, whether it's, you know, before they actually look at it, they're just touring and they have a question, you know, or they're actually getting ready to, to sign it and they're reading through it. They're going to have questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, they're hopefully going to be very easy questions, but once you know your lease and your documents, you know, you'll know exactly how to respond because you'll know what they're talking about. You can answer any questions and clear up any confusion. Yeah. And my goal would be to make it so simple. Like they wouldn't have questions. They'd read it and it'd be so simple, but maybe we'll get there. I don't know. Can you tell me some aspects of landlording and at least being like DIY property management that you don't like? Like if you had to name one thing that you wish you didn't have to do, or you, you stress about the most, mm. like what's the biggest pain? Yeah. Great. Really good question. Um, I would say probably the biggest difficulty right now is uh, the whole maintenance side of property management. Um, you know, inevitably, whether you have a new construction or a you know 1900s built property, you're, you're going to have you know maintenance requests. Some properties will be better than others, um, but I still think uh, you know within our team, we're still trying to really streamline our systems and processes. Um, currently, um, I'm typically traveling uh, to go let the vendor in. Um, a lot of times, most of the vendors we use are going to be working business hours. And most of the tenants, you know, unless they have a work from home job, they're typically going to be working during the day. So, you know, the whole scheduling logistics side of it, I think, is probably, you know, the most difficult for, for me right now. Man, that's great that you said that I can add some input because I had to learn how to do this from my rack and I had to figure out systems. So in my lease, I have a three-step process. Step one, home warranty. I carry home warranties and I did an experiment with that. I had multiple properties. I got different home warranty companies, one to each one, and I pretended I called them up from my rack. Hey, I, uh, um, I got an issue with my you know, water heater. 
and or the HVAC, you know, and I would see how they would handle it. And I wanted it to be really efficient because one day I'm going to hand this off to the, the tenants and say, hey, you have a home warranty. This is how you request home warranty. Let me give you a copy of what's covered and all that stuff. So I wanted to make sure I wanted to see what the process would be like if I was the tenant calling. They're like, OK, uh, one lady was had a baby crying in her car. She's driving. She's like, OK, well, let me get back to you. She never called me back. I called again. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so busy. And then she's like, I'll get that taken care of. And then I got the sense what she was doing is she had her own home warranty business. You called her. She goes in and just goes Googles and just hires and sends somebody over there. And she has enough people paying all the time that she's just being this really overwhelmed middleman that's just kind of like just randomly signing, you know, tenants and trying to help. And she became like a pain to deal with. So I canceled that one and I was in a contract. I hated it. Then I did some other ones and I eventually settled on American Home Shield because they're the most efficient. I told them, hey, I want to set this up as the landlord under my property management company, I don't want the tenant to know that I'm the owner. Use my property management information. Okay, so I want to be able to have the tenant call in or go online and use the address and the policy number. And I want them to be able to settle stuff on their own. And they're like, okay, yeah. And I, they said, you can charge a fee and you depending on how much my my monthly reoccurring payment is and which packet I sign up with, the fee could be anywhere from 50 to like 150 or whatever. I picked something like 75. So it's in the lease. You're responsible for maintenance below 500. And I even made a point to say, you're responsible for the service calls for the um, home warranties. And um, they go direct. That's step one. And the cool thing about American Home Shield, which you have to learn some stuff. There's lessons with that because real quick, I'll tell you, when you have a stackable washer and dryer inside a closet, don't be surprised if the home warranty company sends somebody out there and like, yeah, we don't work on those. They're, they're stackables and they're in a the closet. It needs to be the kind that opens from the front and made to work on the front. I'm like, okay, note take. And I will make sure when there's closet ones, I just put the ones made to the front. So next time this happens, then I um, the tenant can get it resolved on their own. I had to get involved and I got a handyman to take it out. And then I ended up just replacing it with the right kind. But now that I know that, I got a system in place that the tenant can deal with it. Anyways, um, theirs is the most efficient. Secondly, I have a property management software app Folio where they go in and they can do a maintenance request and I get notified. And then I have my time of looking into it. And I like to troubleshoot stuff. And I have a really extensive FAQs and I've spent time with my wife making how-to demos, showing tenants how to change the air filter, how to flush the drain line, regular household maintenance stuff and how to, you know, what to do when a outlet stops working, the trip that GFCI, you check the breaker, it doesn't work, how to reset um, the garbage disposal or how to unjam the garbage disposal. Super straight to the point, 4K unbranded videos. And I try to give those to other landlords because... I'm developing what I call self-service management, where I work with the tenant. I want to encourage them and give them the tools and resources to solve their problem. And every time I talk to them, I do this formula where I listen to them. I say, oh, tell me more. What's this like? Okay, I hate that this happened. I get mad. I'm like, this is this makes me really upset. I can't believe that. And I was like, what do you think? I ask them a question. What do you think we should do? What concerns do you have? And I was like, okay, let me see what I can do and I can get back to you. I'm trying to help them fix their problem. Next thing you know, they think I'm the most amazing person and I'm not doing anything. They go direct with scheduling the home warranty person to schedule with their, with their schedule. I'm not even in it. I wake up in Iraq and I see... Oh, this property got a home warranty and somebody came out and fixed the garage motor and replaced it and they paid the service fee. And I woke up and saw this and they just did it all on their own. <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff that I like to do. And I we can talk more about it offline and hmm. like how you might be able to test some of this out and some concerns that you might have. What do you think so far when you hear this? No, that's that's fantastic. Um, I I love when tenants are always taking care of uh, you know the properties. It definitely makes our job easier. That's for sure. Um, yeah. You know our our property management software does requests, so you know super easy to get those in, and then we you know we handle those on our end. But um, okay. like I'm I'm trying to think. This week um, had really bad storm, and so there was uh there was a tree branch that fell on a power line going into the house. Um, th thankfully, uh, nobody was hurt most importantly, uh, but the power company came out and cut everything up, got it off the line. So that's good. But now we have branches all in the yard, you know, so all I need is pictures, you know, and I can get those from tenants, 
you know, and now all of a sudden I'm scheduling that to be taken care of and I didn't even have to leave my office. So those yeah, are the things good. that I really like, you know, but I, I, you know, I, I love the idea of having tenants um, schedule some of these things uh, on the road. I think that's fantastic. Another thing you could try is when you're dealing with issues like something like that, that's outside of what a home warranty would be in, <clears throat> excuse me, and it might be outside of like what you would expect a, a tenant would do. But when you're in the single family space, which is cool, they kind of take ownership. They kind of turn into a resident when you groom them and kind of work with them and you ask them questions. So when you're, when I would be approached that dealing with it, I would do that normal back and forth with them. What do you think? Um, uh, how do you want to, how do you think we should go about it? Cause I'm trying to get them involved. Like, I was painting a house one time and the tenant brought up, Hey, the pendant lights are kind of old. And I was like, Oh really? I was like, do you think they need to be replaced? Do you think we should paint them? And I said, and I'm working with her. She's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, stuff I do is like, do you want to go online? You can go to uh, Lowe's home Depot or Amazon and maybe pick out three different versions and let me look at it and see if we can put, submit it up to the team and see if we can get them replaced. So I do stuff like that all the time. One of the fridges needed to be replaced. It's really old. And I say, hey, can you you mind you know looking it up? And I'm always trying to give them ownership, give them some task, and it actually works in the in their favor. They go pick something they like, three different versions. And then when they when oh, I wow. get it delivered to them, they feel great sense of ownership that that's the kind they picked out. They know they understand the cost involved in this, and it's just constantly like. Like I would think, hey, how big are the branches? Do you think it's something that maybe uh, could be moved to the side and like the city um, would be able to pick them up? Um, I um, like, do you think that um, maybe like, cause I would try to look into the rules cause I would Google it first. Um, some of them will say they have to be in small bundles. You don't have to wrap them up. Just move them over to the street. I would try to figure that out by your area um, with your city, you know, un it's called a uh, yard waste pickup. And I would ask them some stuff like that. And I'm trying to get them to decide to be like, oh, yeah, I think I can do that. Maybe I can pull them over there or something and basically try to handle it with them trying to take care of it. If not, I will intervene. Obviously, I want the property to be in the best tip top shape and I'm not super cheap. Mm -hmm. Like I will pay to get stuff taken care of, but I'm trying to give them the opportunity to see if they'll do it. And you know what I mean? Just kind of give them assistance to help fix their problem. Yeah, no, I absolutely. Uh, funny enough, with these tenants, they even volunteered to try to move some of it. But uh, with with another maintenance issue we were working on in the same unit, I said, "Hey, don't worry about it. We'll take care of that." Okay. Um, right. Yeah, because it's it's going to end up getting moved by uh, by the landscaping company that does everything for that uh, property anyway. I think there is something in the contract that they would even take care of it. So I, okay. I don't know that there's that there's even going to be a cost. I mean, if there is, it might be very minimal, but they'll just end up moving it to the street and it'll get picked up. So, okay. you know, uh, great, great example of, you know, having good quality tenants, people who are proactive and want to take care of it. You know, they're not yes. just going to, you know, let things, you know, rot and sit there. And I find it, you know, a month later when I'm doing another inspection. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's important because some landlords are um, skittish of trying to get the tenants to do anything because they think the tenants are incompetent and can't do anything and all messed up. Or they think if the tenant is responsible for minor repairs, that they're going to ne neglect the place and not, you know, um, you know, report stuff because they're trying to save money. But if you're active involved and you're trying to constantly, you know, figure out how to help them out, got any problems or issues, how can we make it better? They're going to get a sense that you take care of stuff. And even if it's in the lease that the it's a tenant's responsibility, when you take action and you resolve stuff, um, they, they notice that. And um, everything I do is I try to keep long-term uh, tenants and I'm always trying to like think of them as like, a resident, oh, you know, I'm trying to, how do I keep them long-term? How do I make them happy? I'm serving these people. So I think you're on the same page. That's really cool. I would, I would go down a rabbit hole. We could talk a whole bunch of stories <laughs> like this, but let me just keep going. Cause I said, um, I thought you said you you got to go, don't you? Uh, I have about six more minutes. So. Okay, crap. So let me skip all the way to the bottom of my feedback. Um, so we can at least give you something and we can always talk more later. I yeah, wanted to appreciate it. I want to compliment you on your um, website logo. I thought it was really cool. Um, your um, peakventures.net. And also I want to compliment you on your um, profile picture, which I thought was good to have consistency. I saw the same image across multiple places. The only two places I found a different image of you was on homes.com. And I think it's called crexy.com, like, like a commercial kind of one. Crexy. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pre- appreciate you telling me about that. Uh, some of the uh, realtor websites will pick up an old photo, and even though I'll update it in all the places, it doesn't get re-syndicated and 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 re-uploaded to different websites. So appreciate you letting me know about that. Okay. Cool. Um, and then, um, you. You didn't say anything in your profiles that would have made it super clear to me. I was doing a little bit more digging because I'm I knew I was going to meet with you and talk to you. But your podcast, which I think is really cool, like what you did in college is like that pulling at the heartstrings. It's like very, you know, it's human. Like a lot of corporate, they don't they the corporate businesses don't have the advantages that me and you have when we're smaller scale, more relatable. And I felt like you should put your podcast in your profiles and make it really prominent and kind of relate what you're doing in business straight up to your faith and giving back and helping college kids get out of debt or whatever. So I only found that when I was scrolling down, looking at a post like, and the posts in your feed will disappear over time. So I would suggest like, I, why not put that stuff up in the profile? So nobody misses it. Yeah. Great. Great idea. Appreciate that. Okay, cool. Um, thanks for taking the feedback. I'm not being critiquing anything because I don't know. <laughs> no, anything. No, I just, no, this is no, stuff no, that was great. Like, um, yeah, one it's, thing it, it, it's always good to have different perspective, you know, other, other people taking a look and saying, Oh, Hey, you know, here's what I thought. So no, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Also on your LinkedIn profile, I was a little confused because under the contact info hyperlink, it redirects to, I think it's Keller Williams. It says switching careers.com. And I was like, I thought you were with EXP. So I don't know why that link is there for, under your contact. Uh, does, can you explain that? Uh, yeah. So, so switching career was a website I had, uh, uh, essentially I, I did a lot of recruiting for agents at KW. Um, so that, that was one of our main portals to bring people in to join KW as an agent. So, um, I guess I need to update that, uh, okay, yeah. to, so, my, to my current website. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, I only found your profile on Facebook. I couldn't find you on, um, Instagram or X. Um, where do you operate mostly like on your socials? Yeah, I'm normally on, uh, I am on X, um, okay. the Hunter Gore, uh, is my profile. Um, okay. I'm, I'm on school, obviously, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, uh, and then Facebook, Th- those are probably the biggest things. I typically don't post anything on Facebook. I'm not about doing any of that, but I use okay. the Facebook marketplace pretty religiously, uh, both okay. on the buying and selling side. We normally post a lot of our rentals for there. Um, I do some stuff on the investment space for seller financing, creative financing. So I'll sell a bunch of properties on seller financing. Um, so I typically offer them uh, there on Facebook Marketplace as well. Okay. So that's that's primarily what I use Facebook. But um, I, I would say maybe X or Facebook or, or even school is probably the best way to, to get a hold of me. I, to be honest, I'm really liking X lately, and I kind of abandoned some of my other socials, and I'm kind of on there. So I'm definitely going to find you on that and uh, follow you and like and support and all that stuff. Um, almost done. Um, I wanted to ask when I was looking you up on your on your real estate stuff and even on your website, like I was trying to figure out what do you specialize on because I did see some new construction single family. And then I saw some new construction duplexes and uh, and then I even found you on commercial. So I'm like, when I went to your website, I was clicking around. Some of the links didn't work. I did see the buy link, click the, the sell link. And I'm like, well, what about property management? Um, are, what is this creative financing? So I, I, and also on your website, there was some testimonials that were not filled in. And I'm like, okay, maybe it's a new website. So my, my biggest thing would be on that is I, I think it'd be cool to tie in your podcast, your faith, your, your, any kind of like charity things. If you're still doing like you know, helping college kids get out of debt because it makes it really relatable. I think that's cool. And also um, maybe who's your avatar. Like if, if your ideal avatar, which is, let's say I'm an investor and I'm looking for new construction duplexes in South Carolina and um, or I don't know. Basically, I was a little bit like trying to figure it out. Like, can you explain to me who you think your best avatar would be if you direct them to your website and what you would think that they would want to see? Yeah, um, probably would be a real estate agent and real estate investor who uh, who property manages or, or self manages. Um, so r- really with peak ventures, that's really sort of the, uh, public facing, um, not that I want it to come across as super corporate, but I want people to think that, Hey, we are, you know, we're, we're professional, you know, property managers. We don't manage, 
you know, for, uh, you know, all these different people, but for the properties we do manage, you know, we, we take it very seriously. So okay. it's to, it, it's to sort of come across as, Hey, Peak Ventures is a, is the property management company. You know, we, we you know, we, we are very professional, you know, we have a, a, a team to help us, you know, do what we do. Um, so that's, that's sort of the image that it wants to come across. I, I don't really even have a personal website. I probably should, cause I've thought about it, but I think the personal website would maybe tie in a couple of these different pieces that you're, uh, that you're talking about. Okay. So now I think I, I was a little confused with something. So your property management, I was like, why would it be on your website? Because I thought you're only doing it for yourself and your family. But then I was like, wait a second, you're running that, uh, brokerage property management, you know, a business firm with a team and you're looking for clients with that. Is that why the website would be more corporate-y? Uh, sort of. Yeah. So, uh, so we're with, within the umbrella, we're always looking for people who want to buy and sell properties. That could be something that, that, you know, I could represent them as an agent, something we could take down and buy as an investment, or, you know, if people need, you know, property management, really ideally on the tenant side of things, they can go to the website and they can see all the available rentals that we have. Okay. Do you have somebody helping you with that website? Or are you running? Uh, I, uh, I do. Um, yeah. So uh, we, we had built it earlier in the year, but uh, I, I was funny enough, you mentioned some things on there. I was looking back through the other day. I was like, this is like, there, there was a couple pages of this. Yeah. So that's, uh, I, that's one of the things we're, we're working on updating. Yeah. So. Just, just area to, to improve, you know, always trying to get better. And I, at least you see how I was confused and uh, trying to figure it out a little bit, but it's all for friendly, helpful advice, good feedback. Um, One more thing, two more things, YouTube, you don't have a YouTube channel. I, I do. Um, it's a pretty old channel. I haven't updated anything. It's it's mostly a bunch of technology videos with Keller Williams from years ago. Um, but no, uh, so that is one of the things I'm looking to start growing and to actually officially launch is, or the relaunch, I guess, is, is my YouTube channel. So Okay, good. Yeah, definitely let me know. Keep me in the loop with that. And um, just as far as the faith thing, I wanted to talk more about that, man. It's really important. And um, I just want to encourage you more. Keep doing what you're doing. And I would like to recommend a book that was my favorite business book. It's How to Raise uh, – no, two. How to Raise Yourself from Failure to Success um, in Selling. Uh, by hmm. Bet Frank Betcher. It's an old book. Um, and it's all about like, you know, doing really good with selling and serving people. And it's um it has like references to Benjamin Franklin in there. It's just a great book. Um, and then the next one would be um Business Secrets from the Bible, written by a, a rabbi that happens to like speak to a lot of Christian churches and stuff like that. And it's basically um yeah, ancient, awesome. yeah, ancient uh 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 what do you, what do you say? It was ancient biblical wisdom from the Jewish, you know, faith and everything and, um, why they're often very successful in business and everything. And like how they use the, the business, um, principles and wisdom from the Bible to serve God's other children. And it's just really impressive because when you, instead of everybody chasing money, you're actually looking at serving people. And if, and if you serve people as good as you can, cause you care about them, they're God's other children. The consequence of serving God's other children really good is you make money and the better you serve hmm. God's other children, the more money you make. And it, it, it kind of looks at him as a father and he wants his kids, children to, you know, play nice amongst each other. And business does that. You may have issues with other countries or whatever, but you'll trade with them and, you know, you'll barter with people and, and stuff. And it actually brings people together in a constructive medium of like business. And it's, I don't know, I would definitely recommend those two books and I could just end it with that. I, it was a great pleasure talking to you. Do you have anything to add? Do you want to suggest ways that people get in contact with you or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, Renee, I appreciate you uh, having me on and just, you know, taking some time to chat. Always good to connect with other, you know, like-minded people who are, you know, in business, um, you know, in the faith, you know, doing doing the same thing, self-managing. Um, you know, that's that's really a big aspect of what we do. But yeah, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, um, find me on X. The uh, Hunter Gore is my username. Um, yeah, would love to connect on there. Um, yeah, appreciate it. Great. I will put some notes and stuff below and then I'll share these videos with you and I'm going to go ahead and end it right now. Thanks. See you later. Bye. Thanks.